Hello, this is Dr. James Strickler, and this video lesson will cover Chapter 4, Colonial Society, in the American History textbook, American Yop. Like I've done in previous chapters, I will divide up this lesson into different subtopics covered in the chapter. The first of those will be slavery. By the year 1751, slavery was legal in all the British colonies, including the 13 colonies that would eventually become the United States of America. But that does not mean it was the same in all 13 of the colonies. Virginia was the first place where slavery took a big foothold. It was because of the production of tobacco. Tobacco was a labor-intensive agricultural product, and they required a lot of workers to plant it and harvest it, etc. For reasons that we talked about in a previous lesson, they imported slaves from Africa to do this for them. With it being the major cash, cash crop and re requiring so much slave labor, by the year 1750, there were 100,000 or more slaves living in the colony of Virginia. That was about 40% of the population at the time. This slave agriculture society was sustained by certain laws that covered the inheritance of land in Virginia. A couple of these legal principles are listed on this slide. One of those is the idea of primogenitor. This simply meant that when a landholder died, his land was inherited solely by his oldest male heir. Now, the reason this is important is if you have a vast estate with lots of land on it that's being cultivated by slaves, then it remains a vast estate with lots of land on it being cultivated by slaves when the owner dies and the son takes over, rather than it being chopped up into smaller pieces and distributed among all the children. This is important because a slave economy relies upon large tracts of land being worked by large numbers of people. The second law that was found in Virginia was enforcing a, a principle called entail. What entail meant was that it was hard to break up these vast chunks of land, even after inheritance. If the son inherits it and he wanted to chop it up and sell it off, he had all kinds of legal hurdles to get past to do that, which meant that these vast estates stayed intact, which meant that they were ideal for this agricultural economy based on slavery. This is one of the reasons why slaves became so numerous in Virginia and the practice last there, lasted there for so long. As I mentioned on the previous slide, the way that uh, products were raised in Virginia, such as tobacco, was through large estates with large numbers of slaves working on them. They worked in what was called the gang labor system. This is where slaves would be brought in and they would work as large groups with an overseer who would enforce strict discipline upon them to make sure that they did their tasks as they were assigned to do. In a sense, this uh, didn't make use of individual slave skills. Instead, it made use of them as just a mass. It, they were cogs in a machine, each of them doing their little part as assigned by the overseer, rather than out there thinking and doing things for themselves. Now, one of the good things about this for the person who's employing the slaves, actually I shouldn't say employing, is enslaving the, these people from Africa, is that they're interchangeable. Um, if for some reason a slave dies or becomes sick, you can plug a new one into that. This also meant that they didn't have to maintain family relationships, that they could bring new workers in from, from Africa and plug them into a spot and just show them that, that thing to do. This is how slave labor was operated in Virginia during the colonial time period. South Carolina was another colony that had a large number of slaves. By 1750, a majority of the population in South Carolina were slaves. 
the main site for the entrance of slaves into the 13 colonies was known as Charlestown originally, and eventually was known as Charleston. This was the big slave center for bringing slaves in from Africa and selling them. This also became a, a place where white elites would have their homes in South Carolina. They were usually absent landowners. Now what I mean by this is they would have huge estates out in the countryside, these vast plantation where they would raise crops, where they would employ many slaves to do it, but they would not personally live there. Instead, they would maintain houses in the big city, so to speak, and there they would reside away from the actual practices of slavery. Now, this had a couple of important effects. One was that it sort of disconnected them from the brutal reality of slavery out there. But it also did something else. You see, the way slaves were um, you know, worked in South Carolina was different than in Virginia. The crops that were being raised in South Carolina, at least initially, were different, and this was the cause. For example, rice was one of the big crops raised in Virginia because the climate was good for it. It was enough tropical that it could be raised there like it was back in Africa where the slaves had come from. So notice this contrast. The slaves that came to Virginia were then employed in raising a crop that they had never raised before, tobacco. And so they were instructed how to, how to do a specific thing and assigned to it. As I said previously, they were just cogs in a machine. On the other hand, when you bring slaves to South Carolina to raise rice, they already have experience doing this. They may understand it better than the person who is their overseer or their master, their owner. And so they were given a lot more autonomy. In other words, a lot more freedom to decide what they would do as they accomplish the jobs assigned to them. So South Carolina, rather than operating on what was in Virginia characterized as the gang labor system, instead operated primarily on a task labor system. This is where you would assign an individual slave a certain thing to get done and then give them the opportunity to go do it. Now, this created more autonomy, as I said, among the slaves of South Carolina, particularly because the people who owned the land that they were working were absent also. So they could form their own societies, their own communities. They were oftentimes kept together with people that spoke similar languages so they could work more efficiently. And this allowed a, a network of cultures that still remembered much of the African influence that they had brought with them. Now, this autonomy though, led to a certain sense of independence. They were not wanting to accept their lot as slaves. And this led in 1739 to a slave rebellion called the Stono Rebellion. During this Stono Rebellion, a group of about 80 slaves tried to march to their freedom in Florida. You may remember from a previous lesson me explaining that the Spanish, to compete with the English settlers to the north, tried to get slaves to escape to freedom in Florida. They offered them their freedom if they would learn Spanish and convert to the Catholic Church. Well, these slaves wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to flee to Florida to become free. So they started marching south. Along the way, they set fire to plantations. They killed as many as 20 white people along the way. Eventually, they were stopped, and the rebellion was a failure. But this shows how the, the greater autonomy among the slaves in South Carolina may have contributed to their willingness to engage in a failed rebellion like this. After uh, the founding of South Carolina, much later, the colony of Georgia was also founded. It was um, settled in a different way, though, than South Carolina. The original settling of Georgia was because people from England noticed that there was this empty land, essentially, between South Carolina and Florida. And their worry was that the uh, Spanish would come up in, from Florida and grab it. So the English decided to grab it first. And it was originally established as a debtor colony. What is meant by this is that people who were in prison in England because they couldn't pay their debts were given an opportunity to start a new life in Georgia. 
So being founded in this weird way, it meant that Georgia didn't have the, the standard sort of, of governor or um, uh, other single figure over it that was in charge. Instead, there was a group of trustees that were put in charge of Georgia, a small group of people who were thought to be wise that could set policies for this colony. Well, in 1735, they banned the practice of slavery in Georgia. Now, this may seem very unusual from our modern perspective, knowing, knowing that Georgia was a slave state, but initially it was a free colony. That changed in 1751 for a very strange reason. There was a preacher, a man named George Whitfield, a very famous religious figure in the colonies, who we will actually talk about more later in this lesson, who wanted to go about doing some good. And he noticed that in Georgia, there was a large number of orphans and there was no place to, for them to be raised. He wanted to start an orphanage in Georgia which eventually became the Bethesda Boys Home. But he had a problem. He didn't have the money to pay for the orphanage. Well, as he looked over the situation, he realized that a way that he could make this work financially is if he had free labor at the orphanage. In other words, if he could have slaves work there. So he petitioned the government back in England, specifically the king, for permission to have slaves in Georgia. That permission was granted in 1751, and for the purpose of helping out with orphans, slavery came to Georgia. Another place where slavery existed in the colonies that you might not immediately think of is what would be New York. Now, you may remember from a previous lesson that the, that the colony and the city that would eventually be called New York were originally New Amsterdam. They were settled by the Dutch, by people from the Netherlands, and they made a living um, by trading with slaves. And so they ended up with a lot of slaves in their colony in the New World. Now, I shouldn't say they just made a living by trading slaves. That was one of the things they did. Um, they set up New Amsterdam as a way to have a presence to trade with the Native Americans here to make profit off of that also. But they were the first slave traders along the coast of North America. They were the ones that sold the first batch of slaves to the colonists in Virginia, where eventually there'd be 100,000 of them. But initially, slavery was brought to what would become the 13 original states of the United States by the Dutch bringing slavery to New Amsterdam, which would become New York City. By 1700, 40% of the population in New York city were slaves. Well, this high slave population um, in a place that wasn't really geared to slavery like the South, and I'll explain more about that in just a moment, um, left a lot of conflict between the people that were enslaved themselves and other immigrants to the city. And this conflict boiled over with a slave rebellion in 1712. About nine white people were killed by the rebelling slaves, and over 20 slaves were executed as punishment for this, while others died while they were in prison for it. Pennsylvania was another colony in this same basic area um, of what would become the United States of America eventually, that also flirted with the idea of slavery to begin with. But remember, as I've previously taught, Pennsylvania was founded as a refuge for Quakers. Quakers were a religious group that had come from England that had broken away from the, the Protestant religion that was there and came to America so they could practice their faith the way that they wanted. And they were very concerned about the morality of things they did. Uh, one of the things they're known as for is being pacifists. In other words, they didn't like the idea of going to war. They were also people who engaged in prison reform, where before they came along, uh, people who were caught with committing crimes would be punished with physical punishments like whipping or hanging. They decided to set up prisons in Pennsylvania to try to reform people. So they were very progressive in these sorts of views. And in the years from 1758 to 1772, there began to be a great debate in Quaker congregations about whether or not slavery should be legal in Pennsylvania. 
Now, there weren't a lot of slaves in Pennsylvania because it wasn't really the right kind of place for it, as I'll explain more in a few moments. But there were some, and the Quakers had to figure out whether this was okay, whether it was even okay for Quakers to have slaves. And over the course of these years, they, as sort of the biggest, most important faction of society in Pennsylvania, finally settled on a strictly anti-slavery position where if you were a Quaker and you accepted slavery, you could even be kicked out of their congregations eventually for holding that position. To the north of New York and Pennsylvania was the colony of Massachusetts. This is where the Pilgrims settled. This was a very religious colony. But they didn't have to deal as much with slavery as some of the colonies to the south. Only 2% of the colonists in Massachusetts were slaves by the year 1760. Now, the reason for this difference is because of the climate and the, the terrain, the geography. As you move farther north, um, the land is not the best for having these giant plantations that raise crops that require intense physical labor to raise them. You just don't have the widespread cultivatable land like you do in the South. You don't have the climate to raise crops like tobacco and uh, eventually cotton and rice and indigo and things like that over vast stretches of land. Instead, particularly by the time you get up to New England, you have small farmers with small farms that raise what they need for their family and then sell the excess to the people in the cities. Well, within their family, they have the labor they need. And so they didn't need to buy slaves. Slaves would be an unnecessary exp expense that they would not get a sufficient return on. So there were a few slaves in Massachusetts, which made, which made it easy for Massachusetts to eventually make slavery illegal. It really didn't harm anybody there who, I should say, it didn't cause anyone to feel harmed by having their slaves taken away because there were so few of them. But this doesn't mean that colonies like Massachusetts spread through New England didn't benefit from slavery. One of the major features of their economies was that they did business with colonies that were heavily filled with slaves, particularly the colonies of the Caribbean, or what was known at this time as the West Indies. So we have those islands out in the Caribbean Ocean which I told you in a previous lesson, had basically become um, places to raise things like sugarcane to take and sell into Europe. And so they tried to maximize their profits by putting the entire island under cultivation and employing as many slaves and working them to death as necessary to just squeeze as much of their products out of those islands as they could. Well, if you put the whole island into cultivation to raise, say, sugarcane, then there's no land to raise food. So where do you get your food from then? Well, you ship it in from the farms in New England. So you have money being made through the slave economy in the Caribbean being used to buy food from New England. So those people in New England are making their money, essentially, off the slave trade too. The next topic to cover is colonial governments. There were three basic ways to set up a government in the colonies at this time. The first was a provincial colony. This was a colony that was set up with a direct responsibility to the king. These were sometimes thought, uh, described as royal colonies. In a provincial colony, the king would appoint a governor, and then the people there might be able to elect an assembly to uh, say what kind of laws they want, but the governor would have a veto over anything the assembly did. So day to day, he might not be managing what the colony can and can't do, but ultimately he can decide by simply telling them, no, they're not allowed to do what they think they're allowed to do. And he would do this to keep the king happy. So this is the kind of colony that was much more directly under the control of the king back in England than other colonies might be. 
Some uh, colonies that had this structure through much of their history are New Hampshire, New York, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Now, I said it that way that they had through much of their history because some of the colonies would change the nature of their government during their history. The other kind of colony that uh, was more directly controlled from the top down was a proprietary colony. This is where some important person was essentially given a chunk of land in America to do with as they please. This person was called the Lord Proprietor. So an example of this in the picture here on the slide is William Penn. William Penn was first given the colony of Delaware, then the colony of Pennsylvania. The colony of Pennsylvania he set up as a refuge for Quakers because he himself was a Quaker. So this becomes the authority figure over the colony. And the Lord Proprietor then appoints a governor. And then the governor interacts with the assembly in ways similar to the provincial quality colony, excuse me, although not with as much control. And the reason for this is that the Lord Proprietor setting up a colony to meet some specific needs that they see would oftentimes set up the colonies with more basic freedoms in place than you might find in a provincial colony. So for example, the Lord Proprietor in Pennsylvania, being a Quaker, wanted to set up a colony with religious freedom where his people would not be persecuted. And that is the sort of way that these proprietary colonies had more freedom than the provincial colonies did. Pennsylvania and Delaware set up by um, William Penn are examples of this. So were New Jersey and Maryland. The third kind of colonial government that you would have were charter colonies. Charter colonies uh, came into being when some group got a permission from the government in England, from the king, to come set up a colony in America. So when I say a group got this permission, I'm referring to, like, for example, the pilgrims to come and settle in Massachusetts. This would be the kind of thing that would happen is, is groups would come together with a charter, permission to come here. They would then see themselves as the rulers of the colony, this group of people, the citizens. And so this would later be formalized as the voters being the main power in the colony. The voters, they would then select a governor and an assembly and courts and things like that to set up the government. But notice in this system, who ultimately has the power is the voters, not the king. They tell the governor and assembly what to do. Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut are examples of charter colonies. Within these colonies, particularly these charter colonies, people felt a certain obligation, a, a, a civic duty to do their part to see the colony succeed. In other words, while they might not be in the government themselves, individual citizens were expected to do things to make sure that the government would be successful. There were three basic civic duties that at least every adult male was expected to fulfill. The first of those was that if need arose, he would be part of the militia, part of an informal military force that would get together to defend the colony from those who might threaten it. Every adult male was expected to have a gun and be ready to participate in the militia if necessary. They were also expected to participate in voting, the process of choosing who the actual members of the government would be. That was a duty that people had, and oftentimes uh, the number of people voting would be very high in a given community. And the third obligation they had was to pay taxes, to do their part to sustain the government that they had created to provide certain things for them, such as safety or other public services. Now, in the previous slide, I kept mentioning adult males because this was very much an adult male dominated society. And this can be seen in one particular legal principle that was mentioned in this chapter and will be mentioned in other chapters too, if I recall. That is a principle called coverture. Under coverture, an adult woman who was married had all her legal rights taken over by her husband. So if somebody couldn't go make a contract with a woman once she was married, instead they would have to make it with her husband 
even if the contract involved her doing something like saying have a business where she, I don't know, sold clothes she made or something like that. The contract would be through her husband. She had no legal rights, no legal existence, except as a subset of the husband. The next topic in this chapter to cover is religious revival. During this time period in colonial history, there was a great religious revival that swept across all the colonies, which is known historically as the Great Awakening. It was a period of several decades of greater religious fervor than it came before or immediately after. The root of this was the colonies have been established for many decades, in some cases hundreds of years now. They've had people settled there that have established themselves and have eventually moved beyond just trying to scrape out a bare living on the edge of the wilderness. Now they're living more comfortably with established agricultural um, enterprises, living in established cities. Life in a sense had become comfortable. And there was this general feeling that that comfort of life was leading to the rising generation, the children that were growing up to, in it, to not understand the necessity of having God in their lives. They felt like they, as a, as a people, were drifting away from God and they needed a reawakening. This great awakening began in Massachusetts um, among the con congregation of a particular minister named John Edwards. John Edwards gave a well-known uh, uh, excuse me, sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God that ended up being made into a pamphlet and circulated around the colonies. But it's not just that sermon that he's known for. He taught his people that they were predestined. And what is meant by that is that God had chosen them before they ever came to earth to either be saved or damned. Now, the reason he thought to teach this was there was this, this belief that if God is all-knowing and all-powerful, then he knows what we're going to do before we even come here and do it, which means before we even get here, he knows whether we're going to heaven or hell. hell. So this idea of predestination, though, meant that your eternal reward is already known. It's just a question of figuring out whether or not you're one of the saved or the damned. So what Jonathan Edwards noticed as a preacher was that people would go about doing good works just to prove to everybody else that they were among the saved. Essentially, it was to show off for other people. And he thought that they should identify who they were by instead of doing outward deeds, instead look into their hearts and see what was in there to see if God was really present within them. Now, as they did this under his uh, sermons, what happened was some people started having physical manifestations um, where they would gyrate and convulse as evidence of, they thought, the spirit working within them to show that they really were among God's people inside. Interestingly, this first began among those who were generally thought of as sinners, that were out not behaving the, they were, the way they were supposed to. And it was a way to show, oh, no, 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 maybe I'm not behaving right now, but I really am one of the saved people in the end. I'm one of God's chosen. And you can see this because I'm having the, this physical moment where I thrash around because the spirit is so powerful within me. Well, news of this spread around through the colonies and others started following suit, trying to show that they were among God's people within their hearts. And there was a group of new kinds of preachers that came up to take advantage of this. Among these was this guy, George Whitfield, that we talked about as we discussed the coming of slavery to Georgia. These new kind of preachers were itinerant ministers which what that means is they followed an itinerary. You may have heard that word before in your life, like it's a schedule, for example, if you take a trip. Well, what this means is they would make rounds from town to town on a prearranged schedule to hold revival meetings out in the countryside. They wanted to get so many people there, they wouldn't fit in a church. So they would set up camps where people would literally camp out to hear their, their, their preaching. 
And the most successful of these, the most famous, the most prominent was this guy, George Whitfield, who gave mesmerizing um, uh, lectures on religion and what he thought of it and inspired people to make new commitments in their lives to become more religious personally. These were great, big, excited events that happened during this time period. Well, this great awakening that took place throughout America caused conflict. There are people who embraced it, who became known as new lights. And this just simply means that they embraced this, this new, more dramatic kind of Christian religion. And then there are people called old lights who were much more the, the, the calm, sit in church, um, uh, don't do anything dramatic kind of people. And they thought the new lights were a little bit crazy, while the new lights thought the old lights didn't really have the spirit that showed that they were really saved by God. And this caused some real conflicts between them. The illustration shown here of old lights shows some of them actually rounding up people and forcing them to get baptized who didn't really think it was necessary because they felt the spirit of God with them and following those old rules wasn't what they were at going, to, going to embrace religion for. This Great Awakening had profound long-term effects upon America because it wasn't just about reinvigorating people's Christianity. It was about people stepping away from the traditional structures of the churches and finding new personal ways to interact with God. And that contributed to this feeling of individualism that was always part of America, but it made it even more profound for them. Now, I say it was always part of America because if you imagine who were the people who were willing to pack up and leave the old world and come to the new world, they were people who believed they could make it on their own, who were willing to take a chance. They were willing to become, for an example, an indentured servant just to get to America so they could throw an axe over their shoulder and go marching into the woods and chop down trees and build their own house and have their own farm. These were individual go-getters that came to America. Religion often bound them together, but now even within the religious faith, they are finding ways to express themselves individually and break away in some ways from the old rules that they had inherited. The last topic in this chapter is concerns trade and war. As we've previously explained, the economy um, in the colonies was part of a greater economy that encompassed the Atlantic Ocean, that manufactured goods were sold by the mother country, England, to colonies um, in North and South America, and to trading partners in Africa. What they got in exchange in Africa for that was slaves, which they could bring to work in the colonies to then produce goods, uh, excuse me, raw products that could then be shipped to England to then be used to make the manufactured goods. This was a way to enrich the mother country through trade. So as I explained previously, to maximize this, the islands in the West Indies became purely sugar colonies. They would employ every bit of land that could possibly be used to raise crops, to raise sugar. And they would import slaves from Africa, work them till they were dead, because they could just simply buy more from the next ship that came through. But this prosperity that they got from this ruthless economy was then shared with the other colonies as they had to purchase goods from them. For example, I talked about them buying foodstuffs from the New England colonies. So we had a vigorous system of trade here based on the extraction of natural resources, such as sugar from the, from the Caribbean colonies, um, that drove the economy throughout this system and made everybody from top to bottom, other than the slaves, richer in the process. This then led to the beginning of what we still call today consumer culture. It's called in this chapter a consumer revolution. And what we mean by this is, as the economy grew, people discovered that they didn't need all their resources just to survive. They had extra. 
extra that can be used to buy things just because they thought they were beautiful or fun or whatever it may be. And in the case of some of the colonies of North America, this meant buying British goods that they could then show off to their friends and neighbors. They could show that they had a dress from England or a suit from England or some chest of drawers from England to show by that demonstration that they had extra money. And this became something that everybody did using their excess money after they'd provided for their basic needs to buy things that they didn't really need just because they thought they were nice, they were cool, or to show off to the neighbors. But there were problems making this economy work. And one of the problems was that money was scarce in the colonies. Now, this meant that they had to use other things in place of money. For example, certain products that they could all agree upon. In the case of this slide, tobacco, which became a commonly used kind of money. Now, these are called commodities. And so this is commodity money. It's a physical object that can actually be used for something that's used for money. Now, how is it used for money? Well, basically, you develop systems where you say, all right, a chair can be purchased with I don't know what it would be. Let's say 10 tobacco leaves or whatever it is. That chair is then worth 10 tobacco leaves, the same as it might be worth $10 in a different time and place. So the colonists made do with what they had to simulate money. The reason they had to do this was because paper money hadn't really been invented yet. Well, I should say that's one of the reasons. I'll talk about another reason on the next slide. But paper money was invented at this time, in 1690 in Massachusetts. What happened was the governor of Massachusetts started issuing little pieces of paper that they said could be used the same as other real physical money, meaning coins, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And why would you know this piece of paper is actually worth 20 coins? Because the government of Massachusetts says that it is worth 20 coins. That's what tells you it's worth 20 coins. Now, for this sort of system to work, you have to trust the government of Massachusetts. And you have to believe that if you actually go hand this to somebody, they'll actually give you 20 coins in return. This is all about belief. And it's belief that comes down from the government. This is sometimes called fiat money, although you don't need to know that term here. It won't ask you about it on the exam. But it's money that has its value just because the government says it has value. The kind of money that people preferred, rather than commodity money or paper money, which was just said to have value because someone said it did, was physical money. Coins that were made out of precious metals, such as gold or silver. But the problem was, most colonists didn't have gold or silver coins. Instead, they used some other system, such as paper money or commodity money. That's how they exchanged goods and services. But what if you want to do business to buy those products that we previously talked about that you want to get from England? Well, you have to have physical money to do that. The merchants coming from England don't want to just take your piece of paper that's only considered to be worth something in Massachusetts. And so this created a problem. There had to be some way to regulate what money would be accepted and by who. So what happened was in first 1751 and then later um, reiterated in 1764, the Parliament in England passed a couple laws called the Currency Acts. And what the Currency Acts did was they limited how much paper money could be used. Well, why do this? Well, first of all, they recognized that there are potential problems with paper money. It could be forged, for example, it could be faked. It's kind of hard to fake a gold coin without actually having gold. Also, it could fluctuate in value. Again, as I explained previously, that paper money only has value because people accept that it has value. And if people decide it isn't valuable, then it isn't valuable. So its value can fluctuate up and down. While metal money was more scarce, but it was also a lot more sure. What I mean by that is you know what it is, and you have a pretty good idea what it's worth. 
So what they did with these laws was they restricted the use of paper money. Now the practical effect this had was, is if the colonists can't use paper money, then they're going to have to use metal money. And the only way they're going to get that metal money is by doing business with the merchants coming from overseas, from England. So this forces them to do business with the merchants from England, which keeps all the business running through England, which keeps the mother country enriched. That's why these laws were passed. But they had the effect of making it more difficult for colonists to engage in commerce if they weren't engaging with merchants from England. This shows how the mother country of England tried to keep a tight control on what was going on in the colonies so they could make as much profit off of those colonies as possible. Well, it wasn't just England that was doing this. There were countries all over the world that were establishing colonies elsewhere so they could exploit them in the same way. And in the late 1700s, this competition for colonies broke out in a major war. That war is known in history as the Seven Years' War. Now, it could have legitimately been called the First World War because it, in fact, involved powers fighting each other all over the world. Now, it wasn't called that. There wouldn't be a war called the First World War until the early 1900s. But this fit the description. What happened was you had the big European powers of Britain, France, and Spain fighting each other all over the planet over colonies. And the reason they wanted to fight all over the planet over colonies is because of this system that we've talked about before, mercantilism, which would allow them to extract wealth from those colonies for the mother country. They would take unprocessed uh, goods from the colonies, raw materials. They would take them back to the mother country, turn them into manufactured goods, and then sell them back to the colonists. It was a way for the mother country to make money off of the colonies. So colonies were valuable. And these big European powers ended up fighting each other over them. The event that actually prompted the Seven Years' War was a battle that was fought by George Washington. He was a young officer in the colonial army of Virginia. This was something that was sponsored by the government back in England, but made up of colonists. And he was assigned with his troops to march into what is now present day Pennsylvania because of a disagreement out there between the French and the English. Now this is frontier land, populated mostly by Native Americans. And what the English and the French wanted to do was to have trade with the Indian tribes out there. And so they would build forts to establish their presence, to defend their, their, their stake to the land out there. So there was competition between the French and the English. And there were reports of French essentially encroaching on what the, the English considered to be their area of influence. So what happened was George Washington was assigned some troops to march out there to try to deal with the situation. And he ended up ambushing some Frenchmen and their native allies. And that ambush ended up causing an international incident between France and, and, excuse me, and England, which spiraled into the Seven Years' War. So George Washington, actually, it can be argued, was the man who started the Seven Years' War, which was a worldwide conflict. The part of that war that took place in North America is known in American history textbooks as the French and Indian War. And that's understandable because the colonists were really fighting with French troops, French settlers, and the Indians that were their allies. So if you recall back in a high school uh, history class, hearing this described as the French and Indian War, just recognize that that's a small part of a much larger war taking place all over the whole planet between these powers. As this conflict got going, the colonists became concerned about the threat of the French. And so a Congress was held in Albany, uh, New York where representatives from various colonies gathered. Seven of what would become the 13 original colonies to form the United States of America gathered in Albany. 
and they talked about ways that they might coordinate their efforts against the French that might attack them. But one of the notable things that happened during this Albany Congress was a representative from Pennsylvania, Benjamin Franklin, suggested what became known as the Albany Plan of Union. He suggested that the 13 colonies actually joined together under a single government. This became a preview of what would eventually happen after the American Revolution with the Articles Confederation and later the Constitution of the United States of America. But at this Congress, they rejected the idea. Though they might have a common enemy, the French, that they needed to co coordinate with to fight against during this time, they really still saw themselves as 13 very separate communities with very separate people, very separate agriculture, very separate goals, even separate religions. They were not ready for the idea of uniting together. Well, as the war um, played out over the years that followed, and initially it looked like it was going to be a big victory for the French. In 1757 and 1758, they had a number of important victories, such as the Battle of Carillon in what would now be today New York in 1758, and the more notorious massacre at Fort William Henry in 1757. Now let me explain a little bit about that massacre. What happened was there was a British fort that was put under siege by the French. Eventually the English soldiers came out and the French took it over. And then what happened was the French's uh, Native American allies attacked the English and killed them even though they weren't supposed to. Well, as word of that massacre spread, this gave just one more re reason for the English to fight desperately against the French because they saw them and their allies as war criminals who killed innocent people who were surrendering at Fort William Henry. Though the English were losing many land battles to the French in North America, they in fact were winning many sea battles against the French. The English Navy, the Royal Navy as they called it, was superior to the French Navy. And eventually, the English got control of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, this is important because this allowed them then to move around resources and troops to better fight the French on land. And they could do it freely because the French were not in a position any longer to stop them. This led eventually to a turning of the tides in 1759 what was known in English history as the Year of Miracles, such as the Battle of Minden, which actually took place in Europe, where the English defeated French forces. One after another, the French were defeated by the English in battle after battle in Europe and across North America and other places. This Year of Miracles, when the English seemed to win everything and turn the war around in their favor, then led to an ultimate victory for England in the Seven Years' War. This was finally resolved then with the Treaty of Paris in 1763, which settled the, the war and brought peace to these warring countries. Among the things that happened as a result of this is a redrawing of the boundaries of who controlled what in North America. Essentially, the French gave up most of their colonial possessions in uh, the New World to the English. Not all of them, but most of them. This meant that then the colonies along the east coast of what would eventually become the United States would claim all the territory from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. One of the other things you might notice on this map is that Florida is now part of the English possessions. Again, the, the Seven Years' War was a for, war fought between the Spanish, the English, and the French. And with the English coming out as the winners, it meant that they not only grabbed colonies from France, they grabbed colonies from Spain also. So remember that all these colonies that the English have now in North America are set up to enrich the mother country. And the mother country just spent a whole lot of money defending and expanding these colonies. And the mother country now feels they need to be paid back. From their point of view, 
they just protected the colonists in North America from being uh, um, defeated by the French. The mother country came in and saved the colonists. And so now the colonists need to pay them back. Now this is an important change because collecting taxes from the colonies was a very difficult thing. They were across the ocean from England and uh, they were spread, the people were spread over large areas. And so the idea of going around and collecting taxes from individual people was not something the mother country had really been worried about before this. As a consequence, the colonists got used to living without taxation. But now the mother country wanted money from them to help pay for the war that had just been fought. So they instituted a series of laws that would tax what people did in business in the colonies. To begin with, they tried to tax sugar and then they implemented what was called the Stamp Act, where basically to buy and sell anything made out of paper, you would have to get a government stamp on it. And then later the Townsend Acts, which taxed a whole bunch of different things. Now, remember, I already told you the colonists had gotten used to basically not paying any taxes over the course of a couple hundred years of colonists soiling in North America. The idea of suddenly paying taxes didn't set well with them, and so they would try to avoid it. One of the ways they tried to avoid it was by smuggling. Well, fine, if we have to pay extra taxes on goods coming in from England, we'll just stop buying things directly from England. Oh, we'll still want to get that stuff, but we'll get it from somebody that brings it in illegally on the side without paying the taxes. This became a common practice. Not only did it become a common practice, but the people engaged in smuggling were seen as heroes. They were evading the law to help people get products cheaper without having to pay taxes to that mother country, which was already exploiting them enough. Another way that the colonists, in a sense, rebelled against those taxes is they started to try to make as many things as they could themselves. An example here is homespun clothing. This is rather than buying finished clothing imported from England, they would instead weave their own clothing. Now, this clothing that they wove themselves on their own farms was not nearly as nice as the clothing that would come in from England. But that then became a badge of honor. When you walked around in homespun clothing, it was obvious you were not giving in to the English taxes. And that got approval from other colonists. So even rich people who could afford to still buy the clothing from England might wear, wear homespun to signal their virtue as good colonists who weren't giving in to the excesses of the mother country. One of the things that happened after the English took possession of the French lands was that colonists, English colonists, tried to move into them. Well, this expansion of English settlers out into the areas where Native Americans live was that the Native Americans grew hostile. In particular, a man named Neolin had a vision in which he believed that if the natives rose up and attacked, they could drive the English settlers from Native American lands. Among the attacks that was inspired of this was a siege of Detroit. Detroit was just a fort established out in the wilderness by the English at this time period. And Native Americans surrounded it to force the people out of it so that they could defeat them and cause them to flee. Well, one of the, the warriors, uh, a warrior leader who believed Neilan's words and responded by recruiting all kinds of soldiers to go out and fight for him against the, the whites was a Native American named Pontiac. And this protracted battle became known as Pontiac's War. Now, eventually, uh, the English forces were superior. They tracked down and defeated the natives that were fighting against them. But in the meantime, something important happened, which eventually um, helped lead to the rebellion of the colonies against the mother country, which would become the American Revolution. Because of these conflicts out on the frontier with the natives and the English settlers, in 1763, the king issued a proclamation where he drew a line along the eastern boundaries of colonies and said, well, OK, while you may actually think you own the land from here to the Mississippi River, you don't anymore. Instead, we are going to leave that set aside 
for the Native Americans. English people stay on this side of the line, we'll leave the Native Americans on the other side of the line, and then you won't have a conflict. Well, this didn't work. Remember, I told you before that people came from England and settled in America so they could get their own land. And as things were filling up along the eastern seaboard, settlers wanted to move farther west. So they would ignore the proclamation line and go settle in these Indian territories anyway and cause conflict. But the mere fact that they were told that they weren't allowed to go settle west to obtain land for themselves caused them to get upset with the government in England. How dare you tell us that we can't spread out? That's the whole reason we came to America is we can, could spread out. And now you're going to deprive us of this? This caused anger and resentment toward the government in England, such as the taxes on things like sugar and paper did also. And this is the beginning of the colonists becoming dissatisfied with the government in England. Now, eventually, their dissatisfaction will grow to the point that we will have a revolution, but not quite yet. But this is the planting of the seeds for it. And that concludes the material in Chapter 4 of American Yop.